Okay, good evening. You have a quorum at 7 o'clock. First up for doodle business is Linda Hannum. Hello, my name is Linda Hannum and I uh, live in Hadley. I am a aging athlete. <laughs> nice way to put it. Um, we're here to present a, uh, an opportunity for us to have an indoor winter training facility uh, for temporary for January, February, March, and April in the space that's to the right of the Rockies, old Rockies hardware store. We've been in contact with a rental agent. Everybody's been approved it. The fire department was there today Set, testing setbacks. sprinklers. Who's we, Northampton the Northampton, good thing, Northampton Youth and Community Rowing. To the right of the old Rockies? It's the, uh, the Rockies hardware store and it's the yeah, funky yeah, yeah. U-shaped, used to be like oh, a, oh, oh, an oh, art Within store. the Rockies building, but to the right side. Correct. Of it. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, I'm saying, what's to the right of Rockies? There's nothing there. Okay. some okay. chickens That's I found right. out today. But, okay. Um, so I was told I had to come in and make a little presentation, so I drew a little thing where we would put our rowing machine. It's a temporary four months thing where we train, uh, kids train in the afternoon. Adults will train in the morning and some in the evening. It's not open to the public. It's a membership only. Their biggest concern from the landlord, this is kind of funny, is that, that we would want to have shower facilities, which we don't. We've done indoor training for 10 years and we don't have any, we don't even have running water at our boathouse. Our summer boathouse is at the end of the honeypot on the Northampton side. You can see it across the road. And this is just a temporary, uh, we had a different space in Northampton last year, but we've uh, been back and forth and negotiated a decent uh, rental price for our nonprofit organization. And hope, I don't know what we need to. How, how can we really pull this on? Because it's only a winter thing? It's only summer. winter, and then we'll go out, hopefully the, if the river doesn't freeze like it did last year, we'll get out on May 1st. Oh, okay. So, so it's just a winter, I did. Cold, cold weather. Thing. Ideally, we'd love it year round, but we're yeah, small we just can't afford it. So that's kind of what I have. And we're also looking to hire and get new uh, adult rowers. So <laughs> five thirty in the morning is not too early for anybody. You gonna have any signs? What's that? You gonna have any signs? We might put a, an indoor a banner on the inside. We're not gonna do anything to the facility. We're just we're gonna clean the floors. And there's two restrooms there. That's plenty. And, um, and certainly no outdoor signage. No, I mean with just something on the window so the kids and the parents know exactly where it is. And, and that's pretty much straight ahead. So, so do I need anything else? Well, I've never done this before. So. This How many people will be using it? Um, we have hopefully about 30, 30 kids maybe. So, Students. So, so parents drop the kids off and leave and come and pick them up. Yeah, and there's, there's, coach. there's coaches and parent volunteers and it's, there's no time off while they're there. They're straight out for the, the two hours that they're there. It's an after school, three to five. It's similar to like their fencing club does at the, uh, uh, at the Legion. And you trade, train geriatric planning board members? <laughs> <laughs> for the low, low price of, uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> we would be happy to do that. It, it is an awesome workout. It's exhausting, quite honestly. Yeah. But there, I would say at any given time, there's probably 25 adults at most and 30 kids at most. But not at the same time. The adults are in the mornings and the evenings. So I'm not sure if there's any other questions. Or? We're writing up something now. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. And in case you're all around Hadley, I'm going to do a little stump for the, they have the, um, the Hopkins Academy music program are, are doing these calendars as a fundraiser. I did the photography for them. But it's a great fundraiser to help them get some equipment and they're going to do a nice trip to bring the band that's believed to Boston this year. So. Support your local music program. <laughs> Where do you get the calendars from? Uh, I there's a company in Hopkington. No, no, no. Where were the public oh, God, Where do we buy it? I'm sorry. Uh, God, Sugar Shack, Barstow's, Stables, East Hampton Savings Bank, uh, Esalon Cafe. Oh, any, okay. yeah, all over, the, all over town. And the price is? Uh, they're twelve dollars each or two for twenty. Okay. Okay. So just to be. This is seasonal for work, seasonal workout space for members only. Correct. So this is not going to be a gym open to the public. No, go ahead. Well, 
when you say open to the public, not, any public person could join our membership, right. but they, right, they, right, right. Yeah, they don't just walk in. Yeah. Okay, I'll make a uh, motion uh, to waive uh, site plan approval and uh, business use in the aquifer. Um, for Northampton Youth Community Rowing for a seasonable, seasonal workout space for members only at 299 Russell Street. Second. That's the motion on the second. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes 4-0 with one absent. Okay. So, you so much. Thank if you. you would just write down a mailing address on um, form. Yeah. Where would you like that? Just put it up there, and I'll I'll make it tidier. Oh. Joe Clark, back again. Back again. How are you guys? All right. We are, after all that work we went through this past year, we are looking to move our storage box. Um, Thank you very much, folks. You're welcome. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for your time. Uh, we're currently renting a Pulse Cafe, as you guys, yeah. as we went through for the uh, storage lot. Um, the past year or so, we've been in talks with Salvation Army about utilizing their back lot that they have behind the building. There's a, they have a very large parking lot in the back, and it, it's out of sight from the road. It's also gated in the evening, and, uh, and of course, it's directly across the street for us as well. Um, we finally have the lease signed, so what I have, what I gave you guys copies of is the lease that we're uh, putting into effect uh, starting in January, and uh, our lease that we have with Pulse is ending in February. So you're talking about the area behind the Salvation Army? Yeah. That if you, is. If you look at Exhibit A, I have a map for you guys in there. If you want to look at Exhibit A, it'll give you an idea of the space that we're going to be renting. Benefit for the town as well is because they're a 5013 c uh, we're actually going to be paying property tax on the on the uh, square footage that we're renting from them as well. So the town's going to pick up that some extra taxable. tax. What's that? That, that property becomes taxable. That, that property that we're using becomes taxable, so we're going to be paying that property tax for them. So we're using the space that you see in the back. There's line spots that are there already. There's existing parking there. Uh, one of the concerns that you guys had with our current situation is we're on top of the trap rock gravel, which we'll be able to... Uh, Eliminate that concern long term as well. So, so is that paid back there? Yes, it's all paid. Yep. So does the assessor have to appraise the value of it? The tax purchases? Uh, there, there was already they were able to determine a value, and I don't know how they came up with that, but I can forward you guys. You have to forgive me. I don't know the dollar amount. Okay. I just know that uh, it's not more than ten thousand dollars. No, I no, can't. So we're not going to be getting a lot of taxes off. Uh, I think it's a few thousand yeah, dollars okay. a year. Yeah. You know. Better than zero, but it's not. Uh, yeah. So it's gonna. What it's gonna help for the town as far as you know, it, taking the cars again, taking them out of sight. It's also gonna eliminate traffic that would be stopping and looking at the cars as well. It'll completely eliminate that. Everything will be completely out of sight now. Cool. Security lighting. Uh, they have lighting in their parking lot, um, but again, at night, it, they they have a locked gate at night. So the, front, the front gates are all closed. Yeah, they close the gates at the end. It's, it's, it's not impossible to get in, but it sure no, deter, yeah. deters people. It, it would certainly deter people as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, the one thing that I had not thought about earlier um, is whether how much of this parking was dedicated to the. They, they do seem to have a lot of parking. They, got, they, they have more than They need about parking. six spots and they have uh, a few hundred. Well, yeah. the thing is, so. this front area right here typically gets filled up pretty good. And this back area is probably, even in the busy season, is about half full. But between what's here and what's here, that's that's pretty, that's just eyeing it up. That's about two for one. You know? yeah. And I don't know why they put in so much parking. Yeah. I've never seen more than a half dozen cars in the back. And the different occasions. Well, those people park in the back is obviously the ones that work in the back of the right. building or the cut them or the employees. So. Yeah, yeah. But but even then, they're parking back. Yeah, they're here, parking right up against tight. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. No, I've never seen any cars no. back no. here. Um, all I can guess is when, way back when, when this was built for Franks, this was a display area. Yeah. 
for their um, uh, shrubs and everything else outside this play area. So part of it, and they probably have that. That's probably maybe I'm guessing. I have no idea. Yeah. I mean that was a long time ago. That was one of the plants. So I'm wondering if what we can do is just amend the prior site plan approval to change move the location. I would think so because we're not really. I mean, they. This is a far better spot environmental. The bigger concern was environmental. Because right. Because this is all blacktop. This is all blacktop. Yep. There'll be no cars on it other than blacktop here. Yeah. And it's still going to be unregistered new vehicles as well. That's still going to maintain, other than during snowstorms when we need extra storage. Yeah. Um, you don't happen to remember when we did the original approval, do you? I do not. I, I can dig it out. I okay. Just, I, yeah, I can, I can look into that for you or? No, I have the file. Okay. Um, I just. Are you talking about for when when we first give gave you approval yep. for the remote lot? Well, that would have been uh, I want to say June by the time we wrapped it all up. It would have been sometime around May or June, I think, by the time we got it all finished. Okay, I'll just put down. I'll I'll get it. Yeah. Um, okay. So. Um, So just amend the prior approval and we don't need to have oil testing and all of that so um, so what was the what was the pulse address um, it is it's on the cover page 270 Russell Street yeah and yeah 310 yeah Copy for John, or is that not? No. Okay. So I'll just put down no new lighting. Okay, so um, uh, I'll make a motion to amend your uh, site plan approval, uh, which was originally approved in June, and I'll get an exact date. Um, board determines the proposed changes are not significant or major and can be addressed without reopening the public hearing on the original application. Planning board has reviewed and approved the following changes. Remove, uh, move remote storage from 270 Russell. 270? Yeah. 270 to 310 Russell rear of the Salvation Army parking lot with no new lighting. All findings and conditions of the original decision, which are not inconsistent with this amendment, are incorporated by reference and continue in full force and effect. That's the motion. That's the motion. We have second. Second. We have motion second. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes for zero one. Pass. Thank you, guys. Thank you appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we get to the last one. A couple of bills to pay, but a, an invoice for Daily Hampshire Gazette for the legal notice that's going into the newspaper in early January for the Melissa Heft um, occupation. The bill is 207.32. Motion to pay it. So moved. A second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes for 0 1. And we have a letter from the accounting officer for our big payroll for the last quarter of 2018 for our stipend by 75 total. Motion to pay. Second. 
All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes 4 0 1 absent. And we got uh, just a letter from Bay State Municipal Accounting Group. I guess they do our invo invoicing anyways. Um, you please get all 2018 calendar invoices into the accounting officer in your town by December 28th. Well, the only ones we can left are these two, so we're, we're off there. Yeah, that's the contract town accounting service. Okay. Yes. Yeah. comments in and they had to go over this bylaw punctuation point by punctuation point because they got a lot of actually good comments um, a different set of eyes looking at it and um, you know definitely makes it more correct with the comments that were made Do you have a date on your draft that we're working from 12 4 okay as of the as of the uh, 12 4 planning board Date. That was the last meeting. Okay. Okay. And this was before we start with the comments and everything else. Just a few things that were that I did took liberty to do. Um, obviously, the, the uh, front page was the districts. We updated for what we were talking about. And the one change that I did make that we were kind of hemming and hawing about after seeing all the stuff hitting the fan for the abutting towns that are getting proposals that are within a daycare um, under uh, a location of a marijuana facility establishment of any type we were kind of hemming and hawing the state has provided really about a school or education. I mean, education, kindergarten through grades 12. Licensed daycare and all the other things that were in medical marijuana were not included in the adult marijuana. And after listening, or actually reading in the newspaper and hearing how the, like I said, how it's hitting the fan in a budding towns, I added licensed daycare center under the 500 foot, uh, if you would, I added that to the area with the schools. Okay. Would that be in conflict with the Cannabis <coughs> Commission bylaws? <coughs> no, because according to both Joel and Susan, other towns are adding that in. Some of them are getting way more restrictive than that, um, but they have not turned down anything that has simply had an added license daycare. They, they were okay with it. So because we're not getting overly restrictive, like some of the you know, getting into all kinds of child care facilities. As long as you're a licensed daycare center, you know, you're going to need to be 500 feet away from them. So what, what's the section? Section on that one. 330.4.3.2. And again, when we get to that, if anybody has hard work with that one, we can talk about it some more. This is for an in in indoor growing facility? No. This Marijuana establishment of any type. Okay. Any type, whether it's a retail, growing, processing, or otherwise. Okay. Um, let's see, so we'll go with the, with, the, with the districts. And I took out, let's see, I do have the original one. Under, uh, let's see, I added marijuana cultivator of two different tiers. Tier one, be permitted by special permit for the site from this planning board, an ag residential, limited business, local business business and industrial. Um, but type tier one is only up to 5,000 square feet of, of, of growing facility. And then what I added for all tiers, um, only in the industrial district. And the comment that we got back 
from one of the um, town's people said that chain marijuana cultivator, uh, but this is for craft marijuana. Marijuana craft cultivator to read category tiers to 11, not all tiers. But that's only going, this is marijuana cultivate, craft marijuana is only allowed in, in a business and industrial district. It's not allowed in any, uh, any of the uh, um, ag residential or, or other businesses. So I'm not quite sure why that would want to do that. Yes? No, that wasn't referring to a craft marijuana cooperative. Uh, exactly what it says. Uh, well, it said change marijuana cultivator category two reading down from craft marijuana cooperative as category one. So I was, I was just trying to reference where that was in the, in the district uh, zoning map. So the first category is craft marijuana cooperative. So that's a reference point. The second one now is marijuana cultivator. That's oh, I'm sorry. One. Okay, you're right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Change your code. So that says all tiers. That includes one. So in the second line, Correct. it giveth, and the third line, it taketh away. No, no. Marijuana cultivator, all tiers, is allowed only in the industrial district. Tier one is only allowed in right. the other districts. But you could put a tier one in the industrial district. Yeah, you could put a tier Correct. one in the industrial district. Correct, sure. That's fine. Sure. That's okay. But, well, as I read it, marijuana cultivator, where it says all tiers, it says no in in uh, AR. So that means tier one is no in AR. And then the next line says it, it is okay in AR. Is it AR or, or residential? Ag res. Ag, Ag residential res. It says no. All tier says no. Right. That's so, that, so that means tier one is not allowed in ag, ag residential. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Okay, yeah. now I, I understand what you're saying. And when one say we can do it, the other one says you yes. can't do it. Okay, yes. I, I see what you're saying. Okay, all right, okay. Okay, all right. Yeah, it's like you're saying no and then yes. Okay, I got you. All right. All right. It's, it's splitting hairs, but somebody will. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So that's good. That, that everybody take a look at that. That seems okay. Under definitions. Um, so a couple of good comments, 30.2, I took marijuana cultivator out of every, every place, but in the uh, establishment I left, for, I forgot to did miss that one, and they're saying to take it out, that's obviously, yeah, marijuana cultivator is removed. Um, uh, let's see. Now, there was a comment, we have two different things here. I'll, I'll get to this one now since we read definition, cease to operate. A marijuana retailer that closes and does not transact, bi transact business for a period greater than 60 days is considered cease to operate. Under 30.4, no, no, 30.4, Point five point four, which is approximately on page eight, depending how you printed it out, it says a special permit shall lapse or expire if the marijuana establishment ceases operation for 365 days. And they seem to be in conflict, but they have different meanings. If a marijuana retailer ceases to operate, that's just the per that's just a company that sells. The establishment includes all all aspects of the marijuana, the growing, the processing, and stuff like that. So if you've got a grower, they could very well not grow for 60 days. That means they haven't, they haven't abandoned their business, they just decided not to grow for 60 days. But if they haven't been grown for a year, then they've abandoned their business. So there's two different, there's two distinct areas there, okay? And we may need to make it a little bit more clear in the, in, the, in the 365 one. However, that's the difference in the two meanings, if everybody understands that. Yeah. Yes. 
You had a question? Uh, yeah, I was just curious if we could go back to the last point. When, when people speak, could they please identify themselves? Yeah, sure. Uh, my name is Mike Lupario. Um, I'm a local farmer. I'm working with my uh, business partner, John Washkevitz, over on uh, Rocky Hill Road. Yeah. Um, we intend to grow herbs and medicinals for the use in like, cosmetic products and things of that nature. Um, we're uh, seeking to cultivate cannabis uh, in 2019. And um, I just wanted to go back to the last point about um, cultivation and the tier allocations in uh, the Ag Res District. Um, I just feel like there's a pretty vast discrepancy between the, uh, the tier one and the, the tier 11 grows that have been allocated in the, the industrial zone. And I just think it sets up for sort of a, disenfran a disenfranchisement of farmers at the end of the day and, and small cultivators who seek to compete in an industry that's going to be uh, fairly saturated by an industrial player that can cultivate up to tier 11. Well, you know, farmers are left to uh, tier one, 5,000 square feet. And I'm just curious if we can kind of discuss that point and maybe see what, you know, the board's concerns are with, uh, with cultivation in the ag res district and um, maybe find a middle ground, even if we can just find uh, equal terms and, uh, within the tiers between industrial and okay. the ag res. What are you suggesting? What would you like? Um, I guess for equal licensing capabilities between the ag res district and the industrial district. Um, I'm not necessarily advocating for a certain tier, but just that both, well, both entities... For the people in the audience, what the uh, distinction the gentleman is trying to make, tier one is uh, a growing facility, whether a, a building or in the open of 5,000 feet. No, 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 that's not true. It's not grow or open. We're only allowing in okay, growing right well, now. Okay, the distinction he's trying to make, tier 11 is up to 100,000 square feet. So this was what, you weren't at the, the initial meeting when the people in Shattuck Road area were violently objecting to this amount of growing facility in their backyard. Mm -hmm. So, and if this does not pass, then it's a free-for-all. So. There's a tight, there's a tight rope here. Have you, have you grown anything in Hadley besides your planned cannabis? Uh, we've, been been, we've been setting up the farm for about about a year now. Uh, you where are these vegetables? Or I'm just curious. No, you're no, no, you're, you're here just to grow cannabis. Okay. Uh, herbs and medicinals as well. You know things yeah, that go yeah. along with. Uh, where is it on Rocky Hill Road? Uh, parcel 34. Uh, well, it doesn't have a you know a mailing address. It's uh, along the road, probably. I don't know, about a, you know, three quarters of a mile from uh, from the junction off of uh, 116. Wait, wait, wait. This is not a free-for-all. If you want to speak, including this board, be recognized by the chairman so we don't, we, we don't get into six people trying to talk at once, please, okay? Thank you. For everybody in the audience, there's a lot of interest in this bylaw. Um, and that's great. This is the first time we've ever really been putting a bylaw forward where we've had really a lot of input both from both sides. Um, that's a very tiny part of this discussion. Well, I say I take the back. That's a good part of the discussion. I don't mean to put it that way. However, you need to show up at town meeting, whether you're for it or against it, and vote. Because all of your input if you don't show up to town meeting, is useless, to be honest with you. Because town meeting will decide by a two-thirds vote to either pass or reject this bylaw. So by the, the uh, town meeting that will be addressing this will be in May. I'm not sure exactly the date yet. I don't think they've set a, a, a spring town meeting, an annual town meeting date. But that's usually in May. It's on a Thursday night. And it is imperative that if you support or are against the bylaw, to come and vote, because that's going to be your only chance to either pass or make this bylaw good or bad. Enough said, because you'll be hearing that a lot over the next few months from us to, to reinforce come and vote, come and vote, because it is tantamount to anything else. All the input you put here tonight, if it's not voted on at the meeting and you don't show up, it's really a wasted effort on your part. You had uh, your hand up, sir. Um, yeah, hi. My name is Bill St. Croix. Uh, I'm where I work with a group of uh, with a group called Farmbug. There's a we're a group of farmers and a couple advocates 
of helped work with the many towns with their bylaws. Um, it, it just kind of helped them get going because this is new territory for a lot of people. A lot of people don't really know what's going on. And I think uh, I would, I'd like to ask, uh, add to Michael's point is, I think what he's saying is that when, when things are pushed into the industrial area, that they're, they're, they're forced to be grown under a, a highly intensive energy consumptive environment where you have high intensity lights running all the time, there's electricity, whether it's power and heating or, or cooling or dehumidification. I think Mike's make, Michael's making a point that people in the area, existing farmers, aspiring farmers, could, could use utilize the outdoors and, this, and the sun, the energy of the sun, and, and not have to use high intensity lights, be it outdoor seasonal or in hoop houses or high tunnels. But I think it's it, to restrict all the farmers in the area or anybody that wants to get over Let's see, I think 5,000, that's pretty much like a one, you know, maybe an uh, extra long high tunnel, just one width. That's, that's not, not a lot, like even two high tunnels for, for a big farm, for a farmer in the area. It's not really a lot of space. And when we're talking about 100,000 square foot, that's, that's two acres. So we're, we're, we're talking about restricting anything from, you know, what's that, a, a one-tenth of an acre? Anything one-tenth of an acre or less is the only opportunity that the farmers and cultivators in this AR district have. Whereas out-of-state cultivators, big businesses, corporations, whoever can afford to throw the millions of dollars in this industrial infrastructure that you're acquiring for anything up to 100,000, not only is it detrimental to the environment, but it kind of takes away opportunity. Whereas there's many empty hoop houses in the area here that could just be adopted. And uh, with, with some of the numbers we've gone over, um, a 5,000 square foot canopy space could could co or could cover as much as t uh, 10 houses in property taxes, or and, and we're putting you know that'll give three people full time jobs, a few people other jobs during part of the year. We've gone over a lot of numbers, and this is something you really should take a look at instead of forcing people inside a box and having to grow under energy intensive conditions. We can go outside and harness the power that we already have for free. And, and not not waste the energy we're getting from that solar power and put it directly into lights. We should use solar power to grow plants. So if, so if I may summarize what I've been understanding, what I've been hearing, is that the principal objection that people have to cultivation of marijuana, and really we're just talking about the cultivation aspect. Apparently no one has any real issues about retail establishments on, in the business district. But the cultivation, um, a lot of the people here are homeowners who have lived adjacent to cultivated fields for basically as long as they lived in their home. However, there is a concern about the odor of growing marijuana and the fact that there is no way to control that odor um, for outside growth. And that is why we made the first cut to say that all growth would be indoors and such that no odor could escape the property line. Would, that, would, would your definition of indoors also include a greenhouse? Uh, we're, okay. we're not allowing greenhouses. And, and why may I ask? Because that? the light coming, you, you, you put the lights on at night. No, you know, I'm actually doing, I'm, I, this is a misconception that I'd like to address as well. Um, what, what they have now, what we use now is uh, called hybrid greenhouses that have light deprivation covers. So it's beneficial for the, for the, for the cultivator to have these light blackout covers over during the night. So most of the time there is no cultivation at night, but when there is, these blackout covers are, are retracted to block out any light pollution. So when there are lights in these greenhouses, they're not just hung out on a regular greenhouse like you usually see them. With the cultivators, we need to, with, with cannabis, we need to maintain certain temperatures and we have to protect ourselves from the elements a little more. So there's literally a rollout cover that comes along the top of the gutter and that'll block any light from getting out or any light coming in. Because what we're trying to do is we're trying to mimic a 12-12 light cycle during the flower, during the so end of the year. If I could just continue yeah, with sure, the recap. Yeah, I just because to... you, you people weren't here when this started. So, uh, and by the way, all of this is available on, uh, on our public access TV. It's actually streaming live now, so you don't have to give yourself a cramp in your, uh, but uh, it's, it's available. You can go back to all of the prior sessions and you can see the entire genesis of how we got here. But basically, uh, since it appears the only way to control odor 
so that no odor is detected at the property line is to grow indoors. Um, the only way to control light is to have it in a structure so that the grow lights don't show. Um, I, I just, like I said, I just, the, that's, I'm, I'm just, I'm you're, recapping. You're not, you're not recognized. Okay. I'm recapping. We're not having, a, I'm not debating. I am, I thought responding to your question about how we got to where we are. That's how we got to where we are. Yes, sir. That seems to be the basis of what the people who feel they would be adversely affected by field growth are willing to live with. And again, I re refer you to uh, the link is on the hadleyma.org. You go to Hadley Public Access TV. You'll get a link to the YouTube page uh, that w has all of these meetings archived. And you can look at them, copy them to your heart's content. But I think you really need to get that background because uh, this is, I think, the fourth, yeah, our fourth yeah. round. Yeah. The, we're, we're trying to come to a, a middle ground. <coughs> Marijuana is not an agricultural exemption. It is not an agriculture. The state has clearly said that. Okay? You can sit here and argue all day with us about the farmers growing it and everything else. We understand the farmers want to grow it. However, the state has said it is not agriculturally exempt. It is basically an industry, and you can regulate it as such. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to find a middle ground here. And to be very honest, we're being very conservative with this bylaw. Because if we make a mistake and it gets out of control, trying to reel it in is almost impossible. But if we start conservative and we find out, you know, that's an unfounded concern, we can go back and change it. And I would anticipate over the next couple of years, if this bylaw passes somewhere near where it is right now, we'll be making some changes to it because we're going to learn from growing. Right now we're in an un unknown territory. He said this, she said this, the state of Colorado says this, they said this, they said this. When you look on the internet you see nothing but horror stories. Well, you know, anybody that reads the internet know most of it is, who knows if it's right or wrong, okay? There's probably some truth in it. Is it as bad as, it's, as they say? We have no idea. Um, we're in unknown areas, so we're not trying to throw the farmers under the bus, but we also don't want to throw anybody else under the bus. We're trying to find the middle ground. And, you know, to get the truth out of all of this is not easy. Okay, just, yeah. I, I, yeah, and I'm just, like I said, I'm just trying to get some truths out there. And I know I haven't, I, this is my first time being here, but just trying to help people understand what we're really dealing with. And uh, these are, if you want to check this out out there, that what they use for the cannabis growth are actually similar to what they do in the flowers, like tulips and, and bulbs. So all over the, all over the world, they grow like this with the blackout covers. So um, if that's something to look into, it's well, just that you know again that would be something that would be great if you could grow it in a hoop house where the light comes in during the day and you cover it with black at night. They have those. You know, we're, we're not against that. Okay, that's that's not it. But we, you know, how much can we? How do you make sure that everybody builds them like that? You know. Yeah. Down the road, we don't know. Okay, okay. yeah, definitely. So, this, yeah, we'd be glad to help with any information, too. I can give you my card afterwards. This gentleman was talking about throwing it outside, though, not in the hoop house. Were you? Uh, yeah, that one was brought up last meeting. Um, yeah. and I, I do still support that, only because it is probably the most cost-effective, efficient way for a farmer to, to get up and running. Um, a lot of the greenhouses and infrastructure that has been proposed um, is it's very expensive. It's very costly. Um, I could see a very fair mil middle ground being something like a, a highly equipped hoop house or greenhouse where you do have that ventilation equipment and possibly carbon filtration. I'll, I'll um, be completely honest. The chances of getting open grown right now in this bylaw from <coughs> at least most of the paying members of the planning board, if not all of them, is virtually zero because the concern of owners. Um, but let's say you put a, a controlled facility in. I mean, even if it's not in Hadley, some place nearby where people can get a feeling for what is it really like. You know, you know, uh, I don't know. No sir. Is there though a concern that we're putting unreasonable limits to entry here? Is that something I don't know. Is that something the AG will look at and say this is an unreasonable barrier to entry that you're putting up? So just as an alternative, I was thinking about something to throw it out. Uh, what about 
limiting the amount you can grow outdoors to one half of one percent of the land you farm and have been. And that outdoor growth would be have to be a thousand feet from the nearest residence. As, as this is I actually was thinking about that. Yeah. Well, you yeah. know, we talked about earlier today, Mike. I ran some numbers. <coughs> For the farm that is growing 30, 40 mm -hmm. acres, that's probably a nice little plot. Yeah. However, at the south end of town, you have three large dairy farms. Between them, they've got to be farming 1,000 acres. Probably more, but I'm going to conservatively, I'm going to conservatively say well, a thousand acres. dairy farmers in town are going to make some money. Wait a minute. <laughs> that thousand acres equates into five acres total. Right. Each farmer would have roughly 72,000 square feet of outdoor growth. Uh -huh. That's 75% of the 100,000 allowed. That's almost two acres of, of product. Right. That's a lot. You've got some farmers at the north end of town, again, dairy farmers and a very large potato farmer. That, how much, how many land, how much land do you farm, Joe, roughly? 120 acres, but okay. it's, it's okay. not all in Hadley. Okay. What's behind, what do you have behind the, the land behind your house, Bill? Directly behind the house, it's 80 acres. And then the land on each side is going to be, so there's yeah. 200 acres there, and that's just one plot. So there's some significant land in town owned by, controlled by a handful of farmers that could allow some pretty large growth of outdoor marijuana. From a small <laughs> point of view, yes, only the 20, 30 acres, not a big deal. When you start talking, somebody's got, you know, pushing three, four hundred, five, well not five hundred, probably three to hundred acres plus, you're talking almost a hundred thousand square feet of marijuana outdoor growth. And that's the whole concern about the odors. That's two and a half acres. They should lost these kind of quick growing potatoes and start growing around water. They wouldn't have to. They could they could sow it out. Yeah. Somebody could farm it for them. So it doesn't, you know. I'm just concerned about it, that barriers to entry. That's it, it, yeah, I understand the barriers to entry, and it, it's 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 a concern. But I'm sorry, do people? Yeah. I don't know how to ask to speak. May I be recognized? My, my name is Kareem Harris. I'm an advocate and entrepreneur and someone who's worked with the city of East Hampton over a very long period of time. And I came here to offer some comments um, as we had a really long experience. And we had a really successful experience. Um, it seems the format is more than rather give a presentation for public speak. Uh, the public chimes in as appropriate. So um, I wanted to offer, um, Mr. Starzynski had offered some really important comments about equity. And for me, that's a really important topic that um, relates to the farmers. I'm here on behalf to advocate for them, but I think um, just more broadly in, in a more of a neutral format. Um, and I think with regards to barriers to entry, this is a wonderful opportunity for the farmers. It represents, of course, a billion dollar industry. And it, with um, outdoor cultivation in particular for farmers, I think Hadley is very well poised to take advantage of that. It also represents um, low hurdles to capital um, for capital assets and for converting their farms over. It's a really unique opportunity. Um, one concern that I often talk about and I think is really important too is that this is a wonderful economic development <coughs> opportunity for jobs and income and ownership interest for the local residents. And so my personal experience as a homeowner and resident and a parent in the town of East Hampton and also as an entrepreneur who is a female minority in that community is that um, very quickly after the zoning ordinance is created in our community, um, those licenses all get eaten up by the there's enormous competition, and many people that have nothing to do with this, large corporations, as they were in East Hampton, eye for property and come in here like vultures. Um, the reason I'm speaking up is just I think it's really tremendously important to reserve those opportunities for local residents now in the future. Um, one thing I did bring with myself, no matter where you fall on the issue, um, it's always great and helpful to have different cities zoning ordinances. So I have both Cambridge and East Hamptons here, just to kind of have them all. Um, I mention it because it's, it's just a really good example of different communities working with their unique community to um, craft particular issues that are before you. And, and in particular today, you have landowners who are in front of you who, who want to cultivate the land. 
So um, I think I might reserve some of my other comments, um, but I think it's really important. Um, How many acres are there in a grown summer block? Oh, I'm sorry. How many acres of marijuana they grown? Are they grow I'm only talking about the group that's here. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'll come back. I, I apologize because um, I, I think the format's a little bit different. But I think it's important to look at what other cities are doing. And the 1,000 foot buffer zone that's been discussed from property to property line, if you look historically, because you said it's new, there are many examples we can look at that are existing in Massachusetts and also in other in other states that I've studied. Um, so it's just. I noticed looking at your bylaw, proposed bylaw, compared with the other cities, that it's very restrictive. Nobody else has a thousand foot. You don't have a thousand foot yet. So, is it, was it my understanding you, you had something have from, from uh, residents on the property? You do not have a thousand feet. Okay. So, well, in general, you, 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 you've got bad information yourself. No, uh, I, mean, I was looking actually on the, the website. Maybe I mis misread, but I saw there was a 300 foot one for between marijuana establishments, and I thought I'd seen something about a residence on a parcel that made me speak. And, and excuse me if I'm wrong on that point, but that was discussed. That okay. Was, the the, the yeah. people discussed, but we did not like it. It's just um, if you look towards the the state recommended guidance from the CCC, the guidance to municipalities on equity. One thing they just really hone in on is that the more you zone, the more you regulate and use those tools, you really screen out smaller businesses. And so it's really important to be mindful that the licensing process is so difficult to get through with the security requirements and the special permitting process that um, many times these extra hurdles really screen out businesses and really the people who are most proportionally impacted are the local residents and the small businesses. So thank you, I appreciate you listening to me. You're right, we are, we are impacted. I got it on my car and slide tonight and I can smell somebody smoking a joint. Okay? Is that locally grown stuff? I don't know. Just... Okay. Anyway, all right, back to the, the uh, bylaw. So the definitions I think were um, pretty good with. Uh, they were up to page five applicability, 30.3 and 30.4. Um, there's a comment, 30, page five, and that's just additional. Um, page six, again, simple typo, section 30.3.4 should be 30.4. Point one, point four. I thought I corrected that one, but I missed it because I did see that the last time. So, so thank you. That's on page six. Um, page six, thirty point four, point two, point two. KP Lock recommends we take that out because sword is already mentioned in physical requirements um, under 30.4.2.1 and I think we may want to add the word outside storage uh, to that one above it. And then the very first line of 30.4.2.1 is a typo. It says all aspects of the any marijuana establishment. I think it's supposed to be of any marijuana establishment or of the. Which one do you think we should take? Which word should we eliminate there, Bill? Um, of the. Take out any. of the. Take out any. Take out any. Okay. And. As Mr. Adams stood up, you are Mr. Dave Adams? Yes. I will I will mention your names that you stood up and mentioned and you 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 volunteer this stuff. That you did a really good job finding a lot of nitpicking errors. And I thank you for that. Because a new set of eyes makes a big wow. difference and it makes it more clear. Um, for example, in 30.4.2.1, he he found probably well, one, two, three, probably four little tiny errors, or three tiny errors, and then I found that one that he missed. Shame on you. <laughs> um, that, that simply makes, I mean, it's not changing anything, but it just makes it clear. For example, um, next to the last sentence is that enclosed building materials must take place at a fixed location. Okay. Educational materials must take 
place at a fixed location within a fully enclosed building and shall not be visible from the outside of the business. And you said from the outside of said business. And your simple comment makes a whole lot more sense because a business is kind of, wait a minute. Oh, I said said building. Well, said, because a building is a, is a morphous, but the building, the business is a morphous. Oh, well, said building. I'm sorry, yeah. said building. Right, you're right. Because the reference is the whole, the whole. Um, wait a minute. No, that, that, it's going to be said business because we're talking. Remember this one though. Of the business. Should it be of said business or said building? Because it's referring to, it's referring to everything right here. That's up. That's that, those those numbers actually aren't accurate. I'm actually very familiar with the uh, with the Charlton, uh, both those facilities in Charlton. Actually, my rep, my uh, my attorney represents both of those as well. And those aren't. That's not representative of canopy space. That's actually every. That's including parking. That's including storage. That's and it's and they uh, they're actually using it at part of the old Charlton orchards. It's um, and so that's really that's that's like the less, less than the size of Costco. But anyways. We, we, find, we want to make sure that the intent of the tier one grower in the ag residential area particularly limits the location to 5,000 square feet on a parcel. 
not half a dozen 5,000 square foot facilities on the same parcel, all controlled by different growers. And well, some of the wording recommended is uh, under add, t, add under under 3433, which is we want to thread tier one cultivator. Um, is it okay? Add tier one cultivator or between words marijuana. Okay, so how are we going to read this? Let me, let me. I'm thinking out loud here. That's not gonna work. This is about a retailer. Forty point three point three is about marijuana retailer, not marijuana cultivator. We're gonna have to add a new section. That's okay. A new subsection here is that would say <coughs> no tier one marijuana cultivator shall be located on a parcel which is within three hundred feet of another tier one cultivator. <coughs> is that kind of what you're trying to accomplish? Okay, so we can't add it to 40.3.3. We'll have to add a new section within there about location to address so that one cultivator, tier one cultivator, is simply not all clustered together. Right? So, you know, it's not to say that it couldn't be within 300 feet. You can help see what happened, doesn't it? But if that, that fits, then that fits. Okay. It, it, yes. It, it would be really hard to control by, by referencing, you know, a parcel because parcels can always be broken up. And, That's correct. And in the spirit of um, maintaining the, the smallness of this initial foray into marijuana cultivation, you know, we wouldn't want to have eight operations clustered together. Now you have a huge operation. Right. That, that's exactly. And I think you could do that with 30.4.3.3 by just putting in tier one cultivation or between marijuana and retailer in both in all three places where it occurs in that paragraph so you take that paragraph and take it for being specifically about retailers and make it tier one marijuana cultivators and retailers in all three places where it appears you could have a separate paragraph but well, uh, look, look, that's it's fine. not necessary well, well, we understand the intent let, okay. let, let, let me work on okay. the right way to do that that's fine but thank you okay that, 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 that's, that's the intent okay. anyway There's a, there's a lot of these that are just correct English corrections. On 30.4, this is what we're going to look at. 30.4.3.4, no marijuana establishment, a marijuana establishment shall be set back at least 300 feet from any residential property line. And there, but there, the suggestion is to go to 500 feet. That was down from 1,000 feet at the last meeting. And we say we, we said we're going to stick with the 300. And I pulled out the medical marijuana uh, bylaw, and this is on the books. No grow or retail facility shall be located on a lot which abuts which abuts a residential use, including commercial residential such as hotels, motels, etc., or residential zoning. So forget that that little comment. No medical marijuana growing or retail facility shall be located on a lot which reflects a residential use or residential zoning district. I'm trying to think which one makes more sense. 300, the 300 feet, the 500 feet, or the wording of that one. You probably should get away from the residence district. There's only one small residence district, according to our bylaw. Right, right. Well, this, I, yeah. But we can we can forget the lack or residential zoning district, but just stay the residential use. Now, the only problem with that, it probably wouldn't happen with an RMD because that's only allowed in the business and industrial districts. But in the agri-residential, limited business, and local business, if the lot abutted a residential use, what would be to say that they couldn't go for an A and R plan and split the lot and get a very tiny setback of 50 feet? 
or even 150 feet. Yeah, basically a spike strip. A spike, yeah, basically the ribbon could, could be their own spike strip, they just have to put in two different names. Yeah. Okay, so that would not, that's not a good idea. That's fine. So it's the request from a number of people out there is to go to 500 feet. We have 300. What is the opinion of the board? Should we, which one should we say? So 500 feet from a residential, pro residential property line. Um, I think that was a conversation we had a bit of last time that the, the 500 feet probably makes sense if it were outdoor growth, but with indoor growth, with odor control, light control, light control um, it shouldn't be a problem to, to have it 300 feet. You now that's still a fair distance. Yeah. Now when we're on that one, one question. Yes, sir? Yeah, yes, yes. Hi. Um, I think one reason we were thinking about the 500 feet is because that was the um, limitation of the, the distance from schools where you would have uh, children playing on the playground and so forth. And likewise, you would have children in your yard playing to the, you know, the borders, the boundaries of your yard. So it, it kind of seemed like, well, if you're protecting large groups of children, why wouldn't you protect a few children? And also, uh, I just want to kind of frame it that in, in coming up with these guidelines, we're trying to keep farmers in mind as well because farmers are residents too. And I'm not sure if, if the people from out of town are aware, but a, a lot of uh, the houses in the AR district were once part of farmland and farmers subdivided their, their land and, and houses sprung up all along there. So there are a lot of parcels in town that are right adjacent to people's homes. And if you're thinking about, for example, Mr. Dwyer, you have 80 or 100 or whatever acres in your backyard, how close would you want to put a marijuana facility to your yard, you know? I mean, 500 feet seems reasonable. 300 feet still feels a little close. And, you know, the other, the other thing we were thinking about was um, the next, uh, number nine here for page seven, um, from a public right-of-way. So from a roadway to have that kind of a setback as well because children and, and adults as well walk their dogs, ride their bikes, wait for the school bus, all those kinds of activities. I think people in Hadley are outside a lot and it just feels safer, for one thing, um, to have a little bit more of a setback than, than maybe the 300 feet. So we were asking for 500 as, as kind of a middle ground. That uh, yes, a thousand might be too much, but 500 yeah. seemed reasonable. Well, get, getting back right. to what Mr. Dwyer said, we're talking about a 5,000 square foot growth facility. Right. That's about the size of a tobacco barn, slightly right. bigger than a tobacco barn. If not, it's a relatively tiny facility. Mm -hmm. You're not talking big traffic, big anything. Mm -hmm. no, oh. that, that traffic isn't, isn't the concern. And, 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 the concern is just the proximity. Um, to where people the proximity to, I'd like to answer the question because yeah. there was concern about number one proximity lighting the example that was used with the greenhouse that growing the heirloom tomatoes the the red light glowing at that uh, greenhouse can be seen eight miles away the Jim's house so and we did address that issue the other issue that was of a concern was the smell by having it enclosed and having the uh, abatement issues of smell, and uh, I thought we addressed that too. So that is a concern. And um, there's only so much that you can object to without imposing your will that they can't do something on their property. And that's what the state has. It's a reasonable, whatever reasonable is to you, to me may be different. But I thought we have addressed the smell, the lighting, 
and the size of the facility. So, and now we're, we're kind of nitpicking, was it 300 or 500 feet? Uh, so, uh, the feedback that we've got what, from would 300, would 500 feet make the smell difference than 300 feet? Well, the lighting, well, the lighting, you won't see the lighting, so we've taken care of that issue. Mm -hmm. And your other issue is? Safety, crime. Pardon? Safety and the potential for safety. Safety in what way? Just out of curiosity, how is the 200 foot difference going to make any difference on safety? I think it it feels less imposing. I, 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 that's, that's very subjective. What what are the facts on 200 feet that you can say is safer than 500 or 300 feet? I'm just asking the question. You said it's safer. Mm -hmm. How? Well, I think because if if there's something going on that um, might be a criminal activity, then it just makes sense to have a little bit more of a buffer between. If there's you know, something going on criminal activity, two miles may not be enough. That's true, <laughs> but I, you know, yes, sir. We, we read about things with uh, facilities needing armed guards and things like mm -hmm. that. Yeah, no, you're not going to have armed guards. You're not going to have any of that stuff at a, on, on a facility such that you're going to have cameras. 24-7, yes, sir. Um, I think one of the viewpoints on asking for an increase from 300 to 500 feet was the fact that 500 feet is the same as the distance the board has already agreed to have a setback from a public school and a child care center. So it seems consistent. Children in the school, children in the yard. So that's that, that may not be acceptable, yeah. but, I mean, but you're, that's you're, you're, part of the rationale. Yeah, you're talking a few children. I'm not, I'm not trying to make light of the children. Right. I mean, I've got grandchildren and my sure. children are grown. But, I mean, a few children versus a school full of children, to me, it is, not, is, is, is a bit of a difference. Okay. Yes, sir? Joe? Okay. Joe Stachowski from Shad Road. Um, this has been an interesting experience with the last four meetings. Um, I've learned a lot about how democracy works, and it's, it's, been, uh, it's been interesting to see. Shattuck Road is, a very, is probably the most sensitive place on the planet, at least in the country. Uh, we put up a hoop house, and uh, this is the same hoop house that the uh, USDA gave away to tens of thousands of farmers, and there was only one hoop house in the whole country that was objected to, and that was on Shattuck Road, because it affected the view and the character of the neighborhood. Um, I, I realize that it's unlikely that there'll ever be uh, a growth facility in, in the Shattuck Road area. I, I, I can respect that, and I, I certainly don't want to impose on any neighbors. But the, the, the state rules are that you can regulate, but you can't prohibit. And by limiting it to only industrial areas, there might not actually be an industrial area in town where this could ever actually take root because of the requirements. So it would possibly get shot down by the AG as being unreasonably impractical. And the 5,000 foot thing, and your intentions are good, and I, I know everybody here just about, and your intentions are good, but that's, that's also impractical because your security costs for setting everything up would be almost the same as for doing a larger thing. The, the only thing that I'm, I'm asking to be considered, and this would be a, a very sensitive thing to neighbors and everything, is if there is a parcel in town, for instance, let's say by the town dump, where there's no neighbors, where it's not going to impact children, um, would there be a waiver process where there could actually be a, a systematic, respectful way to have something permitted? Because the 5,000 thing is, is financially impractical with the cost of setting it up. Um, and it would also be a mechanism to move it out of neighborhoods as sensitive as my neighborhood. Um, and as far as the, the other big dairy farms and other things that were, were mentioned, almost all of that land, whether it's West's farm or Tubin's, is all APR. So that acreage is never going to come to fruition on any of this stuff. Um, if, if, your, uh, if your method is to, uh, to limit it to, to I don't know this lady's name, but she used the term, we don't want to disenfranchise farmers, but this is how we're going to do it. Um, I, and I disagree with that. I, I think 
Mike Sarzinski's idea of maybe if a, a farmer who has, you know, so many acres could could actually consider having a small fraction of that in an area that is not sensitive, where it will not hurt anybody. And I also think that we we uh, we have an opportunity in the next year or two to learn a lot. In Wakely, where they actually had a four-acre field of hemp, they're allowing marijuana cultivation across the street this year, or next year, 2019. Because people found out, and this was planted right around like Mark Brucier's house, and right around other houses, and it didn't bother anyone. The only people who could who admitted to smelling it were the was only the farmer who worked in it, uh, uh, the whip, uh, no, Dougie, Dougie was the one I talked to. Um, he was the only one who said he smelled it. The, the police station was across the street and it was planted up to the road and they didn't even smell it. So I think we're gonna learn a lot and there has been some uh, misinformation or misunderstandings or apprehension but I think we're going to learn a lot over the next two years as hemp becomes a more common crop in the valley. And I think people won't have the reasons to be afraid. I think it's interesting that in the town where they're actually dealing with reality of it, they're not afraid at all. They're going forward. In the town where we're only dealing with what's read on the internet, people are reading letters and crying at the meetings. I, I think we're going to learn more, but I don't think that the door should be completely slammed because what's going to happen is, I think it's it runs the risk of getting booted out by the Attorney General as not being what, unreasonably impractical. So I think there should be at least a hope for some place that's not going to concern the neighbors, where there are no neighbors. Um, some place where it's not going to affect anything. And by the time all this unwinds and unrolls, um, we'll know a lot more. And I agree with Lady, we don't want to disenfranchise farmers, especially the farmers who've been here for whose families have been here for 100 years or more, for any of farmers. Why in a town with the most open farmland in the state is the door closed the hardest? I had a comment about buffers as well. Um, I have a lot of experience with working in the community on that issue, and I'm a parent as well, and I really, truly do believe in responsible um, zoning. Um, Specifically, though, I think it's really important to recognize that buffer zones really deal, are a planning tool that deal more with um, soft threats as opposed to, I would argue, hard threats. And when I say soft threats, I mean, it, as um, I believe the chair mentioned, kind of getting at our fears and our oppressions, and it's really hard to quantify, to measure what are we doing, and it can be very concerning. Um, I also think it's really important to look at um, security, which is an issue. I've done a lot of research, and I've been to Colorado to um, study these issues. And um, really, actually, some people think that a marijuana establishment maybe bring crime, when in fact there, there's study and evidence to show quite the opposite. In Los Angeles, um, there's a study by UC, um, what the Riverside, and it showed that in, Los, in southern Los Angeles that um, marijuana establishments with their cameras, with the lighting, with all the extra precautions and perimeter fences, not only helped to reduce violent crime, but they actually were deterrents. Um, served as deterrents. Additionally, I don't know if anyone in the community is familiar with um, Netta Brookline, the medical marijuana dispensary, actually it was able to catch a crime on camera, a robbery <coughs> on adjacent property, because they had so many cameras and it was just aimed so. So um, there is a lot of evidence to support that um, marijuana establishments can actually help the safety um, in terms of the improvement. And also um, the buffer zones are, I think it's really important. Our community struggled with this issue too. And really the issue that we worked together was how do you help someone feel better? It's not something you can necessarily measure. So I know that's the issue you guys will also have to struggle with, but I appreciate the comments you made. Thank you. Are there any farmers specifically? My name is Kareem. I'm not, I'm not associated with any, um, I'm an advocate, an independent did advocate. Did any, what do you think about a farmer moving specifically to a town specifically to grow marijuana? You're asking, from yeah. my opinion, I think um, that if someone is a, a landowner, they should have an opportunity to have a business in that property and go through the legal special yes. permitting process. It's a good opportunistic notion, yeah. though. Uh, if you're young, you don't have a cucumber here, but you can grow 10 acres and marijuana. In general, I, I appear before you not to advocate for yeah. one person, but I think these are common sense and really proactive zoning tools that I would argue for a really inclusive, diverse um, business industry here. Gentlemen, I'm back. I'm sorry. You. 
My name is Julia Agron. I'm from Amherst. I do live a few miles down the road from Hadley. I have a child in school here that's a big part of my community as well. Um, I think what you just said, there's some truth to it. It's a bit opportunistic to come into a community, but I think a lot of the bylaws that we're discussing limit local farmers from possibly taking advantage or experimenting with taking advantage of that opportunity. So to limit large companies with loads of money from being who can come in and buy large industrial properties, I think some flexibility on where small scale farming goes on is part of the solution to that. But I also think that the history of Polish farmers in the Pioneer Valley is that they were recruited from Ellis Island to come here and save farming. So the idea of people coming in and farming is really just a continuation of the history and welcoming people into our communities to perpetuate open farmland, to perpetuate farming communities. It's kind of how we're going to stay alive as farming communities. I thought my grandfather came here to help Fred Scott milk his cows. Mm -hmm. it's a joke. Your grandfather might have, but he might have been recruited there from Ellis Island to do it. My name is John Moshkevitz. Um, my family has owned land in Hadley for hundreds of years now, and um, I just want to be able to say that I think it's important that um, that we can start up even with not a lot of money to start up with. I feel like it's important to be able to make sure that the young farmers can still hold that torch, you know, and be able to still farm and uh, make a good, a decent living off of um, the number one cash crop. Uh, Hadley asparagus, Hadley corn, these things are marketed with Hadley soil. And I think it would be, it'd be terrible not to market the number one cash crop with um, the same way we um, market our vegetables. How many acres do you farm in town, John? Is your family farm? Um, so a lot of it got sold, and um, there's still a 2.7 acre lot that I currently own. And um, there's uh, four, there's another six acres on Aquavita Road uh, that's all farmland that um, my aunt owns. A lot of the other comments from Mr. Adams are really typo errors that I think will incorporate. We do have a couple of other comments from other residents. Um, I'll start to go backwards with this one. Um, on page nine, the, let's see, let's check 30.4.5.7 is about the special permit process. And it says if no complaints have been received after two consecutive renewals, successive renewals, then there will be no need for further renewals. And the comment is that instead of no complaint, there should be no valid complaint. I think that's a much better term to use because if somebody complains, even if it's invalid, that means it's going to hold different meaning. So it's going to be a valid complaint. That's that's perfectly understandable. Um, it seems like a very good suggestion. They recommend on page three the host community agreement to describe the basis used for the 3% impact fee. The 3% impact fee has already been adopted by the town of Hadley. Uh, putting it into the bylaw <coughs> is unnecessary. There is, go to see the assessor of board of select, but that's already something that's already been adopted. It's just in here for reference. Okay, just the fact that it could be adopted, it's got a range up to 3%. Um, and I don't know the tech particulars on it, so I'm not gonna get into how they're doing it, but leave that alone. You want to keep it in or take it out? We're going to leave the we're going to leave in the three percent comment in a definition. Um, but if the if the percentage changes, do we have to? It says up, to, up. It says up to three percent. Okay. It doesn't say after because it's up to up to three percent may be it may be uh, okay. adopted and the town has adopted three percent. Okay. Um, on page two, it says they, they, they suggest to delete section three, paragraph two. Delete the highlighted sentence. Such use is not agriculturally exempt from zoning. Um, I'm not sure why. They said that it's already shows in a table that is subject to zoning. Basically, they're saying marijuana use is not is not agricultural is not agriculturally exempt, and the table shows such. However, I think we should leave that sentence in because that's yeah, that, yeah that's part of the enabling statute as well. Okay. 
They were no, 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 under uh, measuring the odors, which is 30.4. Point two, which is on page six. Thirty point four point two. No order for marijuana or its processing can be de detected by a person with an unimpaired or otherwise normal sense of smell at the exterior of the marijuana business or adjacent or any adjacent use or property. And they're su suggesting that the odor should not be detected beyond either the three or five hundred foot buffers, whichever one we decide to adopt. I think that is sort of a semantics issue, but I think that uh, if, if no odor is detected, probably just say at the property, instead of an adjacent use of property, at the property line. Yeah, that's what we've got to look. Uh, I mean, that's, that's sufficient that <coughs> odors don't, don't skip. So it's either it's, it's detectable at the property line at the property line. or anywhere else, anywhere further. That shouldn't be how much further you can detect it shouldn't be an issue as long as it can be detected. If it can't be detected at the property line, or if it has to be undetectable at the property line. That's, I think, all we need to set. Of the marijuana business. Of the marijuana business. You keep it, you keep it on your side of the line. If it gets across the line, it doesn't matter whether it's one foot or 150 feet across the line. Okay, that takes care of that. But then we've got a recommendation from, there was a question back there. Oh, uh, way back. Yes, sir? Stephen Herbert, Shattuck Road, 81 Shattuck Road. If lighting is controllable, and if odors are controllable in a small area, as in a building or in a greenhouse, why couldn't odors be controlled in a larger num number of greenhouses similarly? And if they cannot go beyond the top uh, property line, why would there be restrictions to 5,000 square feet? Why shouldn't it be open to a larger area for farmers as well? Reason for that was the physical size of a 100,000 square foot building in an ag residential district. We're not sure. The concern is the valuation of the properties. Will it, will it do something? We don't know. It, it just seems you're going to be putting a 100,000 square foot warehouse. This building could be 35 feet tall because that's the limit of the height of a building in an ag residential district. And it just seems to be putting warehouses within ag residential districts. Again, we don't know. It's getting into the unknown that we're simply trying to wait and see what happens and then address down the road. But you're really not talking about building large buildings in ag residential districts. You're talking about farmers putting up greenhouses which can control the odors within the greenhouses and so it's still an agricultural building just like any other agricultural facility with greenhouses growing vegetables. Greenhouses are greenhouses. It shouldn't be restricting farmers from doing greenhouse growing with marijuana. You can, you can control the atmosphere and exchange the atmosphere every 30 minutes with these filters. Odors should not be a, an issue at all. On a greenhouse, a, a, let me back up. What do you mean, what's a greenhouse? Define greenhouse. A hoop house that is fully enclosed during the flowering time so that odors are contained within the greenhouse and can be scrubbed within the greenhouse. Lighting, are they the, the clear plastic or the? Or the if, if they're using lighting, then they should have blackout Okay. facilities. Okay. If they're not using lighting, just growing during the summer, then they don't need that because lighting won't be the issue. Okay. The, the concern with the hoop houses was that they would be a plastic house with light coming out at night. This... You can regulate that part of it. I... I we're, we're getting new information here that we didn't have. Mm -hmm. We've heard of this thing that you could put over a, a blackout greenhouse. I've never heard or seen a blackout greenhouse before. I've never heard of that until you really mentioned it tonight. 
I've heard that it was possible, but never really knew that it was actually truly in existence. So the enclosed building, if that's the case, then possibly, as opposed to the fully enclosed warehouse, the blackout greenhouse may be a possibility, because really the, the greenhouse versus the enclosed facility is more about the lighting at night, okay? As opposed to anything else. Security is security. You're gonna have to do what you're gonna have to do anyways. What if the farmer wasn't trying to use supplemented lighting and they just tried using a light depth technique, uh, light deprivation, using a tarp, no, no uh, LEDs or metal guidelines? Or I can't answer that question. Really. Again, you'd be required to put that on every night or not. Um, for depth, yeah, but still. The, the whole idea of the light is that we don't write, I, this, is, this is the fact. There's, there's no lights inside of the greenhouse, though. You're only using natural lighting from the sun. So there's no nighttime lighting. There would be no well, like the man said, if you're not using nighttime lighting, you don't need the blackout greenhouse. <coughs> but if you're, going, if you're going at night, then you need a blackout so greenhouse. So would you still be able to grow in a hoop house instead of a permanent uh, warehouse structure? As long as you didn't put any lights in it. And orders. And orders. Supposed orders. Supposed orders. Again. Supposed orders. You're not... We're trying to address the issue of lighting, okay? And it's something to think about. Yes, ma'am. Um, I believe it might have been the gentleman in the back there that um, at a past meeting spoke about um, the hoop houses with the plastic or greenhouses, that it wasn't really possible to um, have a filtration system with scrubbers and everything with plastic like that because you have been a negative um, draw and that it really needs to be a hard surface type of building in order to have the proper um, ventilation and um, filtration system for the odors. Um, and then with, you know, we're getting into too much technical detail here. Okay. Okay. Yeah. We're not going to get to that. that I, I, I understand. In the past, All so. I'm saying, and at this point, we're not making a decision. We need to look into that topic. Okay. okay. Is it possible? Yes or no. So I mean, I, I understand where you're coming from, but we, we wouldn't let somebody worry about that if it didn't work. That's their tough luck if we allow it. Okay. But I, I would again. Yes, sir. Uh, may, may I recommend uh, maybe making uh, regulations around the light and the odor rather than restricting the type of structure? Um, it's, it's well known throughout uh, all central and western, all legal, legal states, especially medical states, that even the simplest hoop houses can be used for air filtration due to a negative pressure. Uh, and and it's, it's inherently something that's required throughout every county that any cannabis is grown in, and it's something that is essential to the to the. To the to the life of the operation. So th these things have been solved 10 times over already. And I'd like to add also, uh, cannabis has grown clandestine for many, many years now. And the valley, this valley here is known for its cannabis worldwide. Um, I, you know, for many, many years, many of your neighbors have been concealing the fact they grow cannabis through these special filters. These have been sized up for commercial levels. So I just want to maybe mention that. So maybe think about restricting the the actual problem than the building. Um, would, a, would a farmer prefer growing it outdoors or in a hoop house? Um, well, I mean, I mean, I, if I were a resident, I'd rather be looking at, in the distance, a half an acre of marijuana growing than 10 hoop houses. Well, I, I think part of that would have to do with your strategy. Um, I just asked this question. Would you rather grow outside or in, in a hoop house? Where are most commercial tomatoes grown? Joe grows them outside. Both. You can do both. It's just different management tools. If I could, you could argue from either. I mean, if you have inside a more controlled environment like a hoop house, you may be able to mitigate the, the smell and other problems better. Um, I don't know if people would really grow it outside, outside. Um, but I, I, I don't know. I think, I think you still need a, a way to navigate through this that gives some hope that somebody could get a waiver to grow in a place where it's not controversial. Because I don't think you're really allowed to prohibit it. I and mean, these are really prohibitive. Uh, it's a prohibitive they can grow it outside and wait for it, right? 
They raised four acres of hemp in a residential neighborhood. Without they, got brought, they got hemp brought in Hadley. Well, it's the same plant except a different THC level. Oh, yeah, but, but the THC, okay. That's not the stinky part, I don't think, but whatever. Oh, I'll okay. hemp. It smells like cannabis. Hemp is cannabis. I know it is. It was a lower, much lower quality. Of it. But it doesn't. It still expresses the same, same terpenes and phenyl. Fe tomatoes have uh, terpenes. <coughs> Every plant does. Pine trees, everything. So hemp does. It is smells like cannabis. Yeah. We do have one more item. Yes. Uh, the Hemp Commission meeting is next Monday, the twenty fourth. Yeah. We do have one more suggestion on the setback. Thirty point four point three point four on page seven. And this is coming from a an attorney representing a landowner and their suggestion is to change the wording from a marijuana establishment shall be set shall be set back at least 300 feet from any residential property line to all marijuana establishments and any accessory structures shall have a setback of at least 300 feet from the nearest property line of any residential dwelling regardless of whether the residential dwelling is single family or multifamily occupied or not. For purposes of this section, an unimproved residential home lot or parcel approved by the town of Hadley pursuant to subdivision, a subdivision, definitive subdivision plan, site plan, permit, or equivalent on record with the Hampshire County Registry of Deed at the time of enactment of this bylaw shall constitute a residential dwelling. <clears throat> and this is really to address um, subdivisions that have been approved but not built on. Yeah. What, is, what, is it, what does the board think about that one? I think that's fine. I mean, the, the fact that any parcel can have a house on it someday is <clears throat> kind of speculative. The fact that there are approved subdivisions that have lots that have not yet been built on or sold is there's a much higher likelihood that that will be a residential property. Yeah. So I think that makes sense. So there's not, there's not, there's one, there's only a few of those. Shattuck Road has a couple. There's one right behind me that's been sitting there for 10, almost 10 years now that doesn't have a house on it yet. And probably not many others. <coughs> okay, all right. So we want to put the big thing, make that change? Yeah, okay. Pretty much takes care of all of the comments that we've got. Now, yes, sir. We, I'm sorry, Lisa. I thought I thought I thought Tom had a hit up here. Um, yes, Lisa. I just want to say that um, so because the state decided that this was industry and not agricultural, it doesn't have to go in agress. And if we put it in agricultural residential, it's going to be the only business in agress that doesn't that isn't owner occupied. Our other bylaws that um, we've passed have to be owner-occupied. So theoretically, an entity could come in and run, run this enterprise. And I think having it 300 feet next to a house is really close. The, the frontage is 175 feet for a house in Hadley. So really, it's one and a half houses away from your house this marijuana enterprise you know, is going to be. And so I still think a thousand feet is reasonable. It's five houses away from you, um, and and I think the farmer who originally proposed a hundred thousand square feet in the neighborhood now understands that the neighbors don't want it that close to them, and he, you know, originally I, I talked about an overlay district, maybe places where it's more appropriate. I think the common consensus is. We don't want it that close to our houses. 300 feet feels pretty close. There's one house in between me and, and this facility. I don't know what it's going to look like. It doesn't have to look like a tobacco bar, and it could be a cement building. I mean, we don't have any regulations. It could look like anything. Um, and so, you know, I think with the farmer in the area now realizing and maybe talking about the honey pot or some other areas that are appropriate and even having bigger grows in places that are appropriate 
that might make sense, but putting it in a neighborhood where people jog by, walk their dogs, walk their kids in strollers, and having this so close, it really feels um, restrictive, and it doesn't need to go there. It doesn't need to go in a neighborhood. I think the neighborhood people have always supported the farmers, and there's plenty of farmland in Hadley, but I think we need to move it away from houses, like a lot further away. So to the industry representatives here, that was what I was summarizing. These are the people who vote at town meeting. And so we don't want it near our houses. I mean, we're not opposed to you doing it, but we don't have to see it, smell it, and have it right next to us. Ideally, we're, we're, like, we're, compromise. I mean, we're trying to balance first. things to some extent that, uh, as Joe said, we don't want to prohibit it. We want to hold out some, let farmers get some use out of it. But a lot of this comes down to who's going to go to the annual town meeting, who's going to sit there for three or four hours because zoning articles traditionally come up at the end, and who's going to vote on it. And uh, bearing in mind that only having residents can vote on zoning articles at town meeting. So you may want to move. Depends on the bylaws. Joe. You're not allowing a mechanism to allow it in a place that wouldn't be controversial. It's just being prohibited. And that's, 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 that's even uh, not what you want. To put it in a place where it would not have neighbors, period, where there would not be anybody or anything that would object, there's, there's not even a mechanism to do that. It's just prohibited. And that's exactly opposite to what the state requires in this. Um, I, look, I, I'm not, <clears throat> I have no idea where we're stepping into this problem. I have no idea. I have no idea how deep it went. Um, and I understand Shattuck Road, once again, is the most sensitive place in the country. Of all the thousands of hoop houses given away, there's only one that had a problem, and that was in Shattuck because it changed the view of somebody. Um, so yeah, I get it. Shattuck Road is a very sensitive place, but there should be some mechanism that would allow it in a place that's not like that. Because there's a lot of farmers in town that would like to find a new way to make a, a, a better living. The mean income for farmers nationwide last year was a negative $1,650, and this year the, the negative is going to be worse for the farmers nationwide. This, this past year, a third of the cucurbits in the valley were lost because of all the rain and all the wet weather. And now a lot of land has phytophthora, and you can't grow those crops again. So to, to, to take away any farmer's potential to make a living with this is, it seems a little bit harsh. I'm not telling other neighbors how to live or what they can do. And I don't think that it's fair to be so heavy handed to tell people that they can't even do it in a place that's not sensitive at all. So I think this is, look, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to upset anybody. That was never the intention. Um, the Commissioner of Agriculture came to me and the retired dean of Stockbridge and they said, you know, this would be a nice spot for it because, you know, we're interested in this and we can see it from our houses and stuff. So it's, and I said, yeah, let's see how far this puppy runs. Well, okay, I know now. But why can't it run someplace where it's not going to be in a critical or sensitive neighborhood? Why not? Why disenfranchise all the farmers in town? <coughs> yes, sir. Yeah, uh, well, I... I, I we live off of Shattuck, we, 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 and I, I agree 100% with what you're saying. I think that what, what, what Lisa is, is, is saying, <coughs> by having the setbacks far enough away from residential areas, we're not saying we don't want farmers that aren't abutting housing areas to grow. There's nobody's talking, at least here, you know, talking about prohibiting pot in, in, in Hadley. It's a matter of making sure that it's not in places where People have, have settled and, and have kids and have bought stuff. But it's not about prohibiting anywhere. I agree with you completely. If there's areas that are, are farming and, and not residential, then it should be, could, could we, you should be allowed to grow there. Notice that nobody is here from any other part of town concerned about where this stuff is going to be grown. Is it possible to make the Shattuck Road District a special district in saying that it's prohibited there? Is that possible? And just let people grow in other parts of town. 
Why not? What do yeah, you think of that? Probably be, probably be spot zone. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I probably would. Well, who would object to it? Would, a part, would, would you object to something like that, Joe? You can not grow it in that part of town, but you can grow it in any, any other part of town that you want to be. Well, the, attorney, the, the attorney general says that spot zoning is irrelevant to what anybody thinks. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you know, I wish this debate was happening a year later than this, because I think we'll see, as, as people raise hemp, the exact same plan, that a lot of this has been pure misinformation, that these have been written on and, and decided on, and the emotions weren't really necessary. Nobody was trying to do you wrong. Um, I don't I think there should be some hope for somebody, maybe not even me, but somebody to do it in a place where it's not going to be offensive. Like I, I've used the same example three times now. The only hoop house in the nation, and they gave away tens of thousands of these, the USDA. You can give away <coughs> every, every three years if you're a farmer. I, I even turned one down this past year because I didn't want another one. I mean, only one in the nation had a problem. Shattuck Road. Uh, the only places that they complain about, well, you know, I, I don't like the, the red lights at night either. North Hadley should not be a red light district like that. And, you know, it bothers me to see the stars taken away. I, I don't like that. But, I mean, it is possible to do this, being sensitive to everybody. I mean, you can have it in a place far, far away from people. You can have blackout curtains. You can have those charcoal filters. I was in Melnick Farm where he's got a million, ga uh, a million gallon slurry store that generates methane gas. It didn't, and when we pulled that, I go, even your shit doesn't stink. They had this, uh, they had these barrels where it just blew the, the stuff through. I couldn't believe how beautiful, I mean, if you're into that. But I, I'm just saying there are tools, and to exclude every farmer in town is, is just, it's not necessary. So, yeah, I just wanted to go a little overview some of these ideas are fine. The problem is what we're starting with, we don't have the capacity to draft, draft a bylaw from scratch for every situation that comes up. So the genesis of this bylaw was the prototype that was developed by the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. Um, and is there, are there other variants? Sure. Uh, but we don't, we're working with what we have. We, there are variables out there. There are other options out there. Uh, if someone would like to propose something, you know, it's pretty late in the process for this cycle, but if someone wanted to propose something that would have, you know, 150 foot setbacks for growth in uh, concrete block buildings and 300 foot setbacks for growth in hoop houses and thousand foot setbacks for open growth something like that which would address things globally that's fine um, first of all I don't think we have the information we need to plug in some of those variables you know is 150 too close is a thousand too far uh, but we're not talking about a bylaw that has all of those bells and whistles at this point. We're talking about a pretty basic bylaw to just create a structure to get started with this. And uh, you know, certainly if there is a better model out there, we'd love to know about it. But this is what we're working with. Just a couple of general comments on this. Like I said before, this is a bylaw we have to adopt. Because if we don't adopt it, we're really out of luck. For your information, let's, let's assume the bylaws adopted in May. Okay, the bylaw is now the bylaw. Everybody has to, has to comply with it. And over the summer, like Mr. Tchaikovsky says, we're going to have some great information because of other areas in town. For the fall town meeting, if you want to amend this bylaw, you need 100 signatures to make a change, come, come, make, put, put this shit together with 100 signatures. Well, that may be a, a bit. For the annual town meeting, the following May, a petition with the changes that you would like to see only requires 10 town uh, voter signatures. A much easier process. Or you could really come to the planning board meeting and say, hey, you know, after one year, we've seen this, we've seen this. 
and we're certainly amenable to making correct, like I said, this is the, the first go around. Once we get real solid factual information, and we'll probably have a decent amount of that over the next year, then we can make more changes to the bylaw, probably to make it a whole lot easier for some of the farms and still not impact any of the residents. I'm not sure how much factual information we're going to get given the restrictive nature of this bylaw. Not this but not in town. This is not going to be a, relative to what's going on in Hadley. I can't see much going on in Hadley from this bylaw next year. Nothing. But other towns around us will be raising stuff. All, <coughs> the, all over the state, you're going to be seeing some stuff being grown. It may not be in Whiteley, it may be it's out north towards the eastern part of the state. I know on the Cape, they want to allow open grow on Truro because some of the farmers out there are saying one crop a year will help us tremendously. Well, if you've ever been to Truro, I mean, it seemed like it's on the Cape Cod, but if you've been to the back, some back parts of Truro, it's, <laughs> it's almost desert out there. Um, but anyways, that's just a few facts that we've gathered from Pride of Valley Planning Commission that, you know, there's pl places in the state that are looking to allow reasonable parcels of open grow, and I'm not sure what they mean by reasonable. I'm not sure how good the uh, information we got or, or the recommendations we got from the EVPC were. were. I note that our, the woman that was assigned to us resigned last week, uh, so her heart wasn't really into doing Mike, something that would work for Hadley. I, I, I think that's bad information, Mike. Okay. okay, I think she really tried to do a good job for us. Yes, sir. Hey, my name is Seth Frappier. I live in South Hadley. I've been a longtime resident of the Valley for about 12 years now. And I'd just like to mention um, that I highly look, uh, have you look at the re barriers of restriction, like what Mike was saying, and to really review it because if you wait a year with this bylaw right now, all the people with deep pockets will already buy up everything. If you have looked at, followed every other state or every other municipality within this state, everyone's that's waited, everyone with deep pockets bought up all the space. So if you really cared about local farmers, local residents, local everything, that you would really reconsider this barrier of entry because even at the lowest level, it's almost a million dollars. And that's really off the charts, you know? So what is your source for this? A million dollars for building a building like a tobacco So bar? for instance, I'm an entrepreneur and an advocate. So if we were really representing like big industry, I think we'd be wearing suits and we're not. We're boot, all bootstrappers. And so I'm an advocate throughout the state and my business in Holyoke is ancillary. And even ancillary businesses cost about a million dollars when you look at all the regulations and the 3% hosting uh, community agreement, the 3% tax on the municipality and the 17% tax on the state. That still <coughs> hits ancillary businesses. So really consider the barrier of entry, please. And I. Uh, Really thank you for all your hard work and putting this together, regardless of what you come up with. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to speak uh, to the order of, of potentially uh, amending the, the bylaws come next uh, town meeting in the, in the spring. Um, I've currently been trying to gather uh, signatures from farmers and like-minded individuals in Hadley who uh, want to prioritize access uh, for farmers this year and want to see things like uh, outdoor cultivation um, and, you know, things, some things that we discussed tonight. So I just want to know how many signatures may be required for that to be valid and um, if it's... If well, you, when, you, you can't draw a petition to amend an article on Tom Meeting 4 that hasn't become a law yet. Okay, so these signatures, could they be used in a way to uh, guide oh, you, the conversations we have at planning board meetings or well, to show you, you could present the signatures to us, but it wouldn't, I'll be honest with you, um, you know, I don't, I don't know how many signatures, I mean, there was a person going around my section of town this past weekend gathering signatures. Was it you? It was me, correct. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this is a very, I don't mean to pick on you, but it's I'm going okay. to. It's, it's okay. not a negative pick on He goes by my house and he's collecting signatures to allow farmers to grow mm -hmm. marijuana. Mm -hmm. he, I happened to be outside. He said, would you be interested in signing this? And I basically told him, not a chance. I said, I'm sure with the fighting board that you're trying to fight. And he walked away laughing. You know, he walked away laughing. It wasn't a, a, a pick on each other. It was just kind of cute that he came to my house looking to get me to sign the petition. 
So anyway, so the specific answer to your question is if when this gets onto the town meeting warrant and gets on to gets we get to it at town meeting on first Thursday of May or whatever it is, uh, anybody is free to propose an amendment from the floor. Um, but uh, there's a process for that. So if it's, someone wants to, the, the problem is because it's a complex bylaw, if you, with a lot of moving parts, you can't just propose a, to take off, take out this section mm -hmm. without necessarily having a cascading problem with other sections that, um, that are meshed with it. So you, you're going to need, if you, if you want to go that route, uh, with uh, proposing amendments from town meeting floor, you're going to have to do you're going to have to do a lot of work to be sure you know exactly what you're proposing to change. Right. So not only present the problem, but also solutions and potential. Well, oh yeah. In other words, if you, were, you were, like Bill said, if you change this one little couple of words in this one section, how does it affect the does it does it affect the overall bylaw? Mm -hmm. You know, without knowing what you're trying to do, maybe yes, maybe no. And if the change is too substantial, it could be ruled too much of a change for town meeting because it wasn't advertised that way. So it gets very complex to amend a, a zoning article on town meeting floor because if it's too restrictive or too, pro, too allowable, depending which way you go, town council can say that's too much of a change and it's not permitted. Okay. Would it at least be enough to show that there is, I guess, a, a desire for this type of language to be written in the bylaws and therefore, uh, I guess, uh, prevent the decision making from taking place and opening up further discussion from there on out? At the town meeting floor, we must adopt this bylaw. Because <coughs> if we don't adopt this bylaw, the entire town becomes open grow for anything. And there's no restrictions on anything. It could do anything that's allowed under the state regs anywhere in town. Okay, you could, you could put in a hundred thousand square foot facility, a hundred thousand square foot open grow everywhere as long as you comply with the state regs on security and all the rest of the stuff. On that Sunday morning, just looking for equal accessibility for farmers, not looking for more, not. We just want to be able to get into the industry um, at an appropriate time to make a living. Well, you know, you're older than that or you're older than that. Yeah. Come to town meeting. I mean, I'm going to vote for this bylaw as proposed here, but there's a good chance that I'm going to come to town meeting and vote against it because of the restrictions on smaller guys getting into the business. Yes, please. Yeah, I, I just wanted to address Mr. Sarzinski's question from a ways back. Um, I did spend a, a good chunk of time talking with people in various parts of Hadley, and as Ms. Mr. Michkowski had pointed out at the last meeting, most people do not know that this issue is, is coming forward, and the reason that people are here from Shattuck Road area is because it was presented as a real um, possibility for our, our neighborhood. And uh, I think if, if people from other areas of town did know about it and think that, well, it could happen in my next door or backyard or whatever, that, that they would be equally as concerned. Um, I think you're, you know, you're being prudent in, in um, being cautious in drafting this bylaw because I think not only do we want to consider the possibility for farmers to, to uh, utilize this opportunity, but we also want to balance it with the potential loss in property values for, for residents. And by making, um, by not making the um, setbacks and things like that um, large enough, then, then you run the risk of, of a real decrease in, in people's property values. Um, so, you know, that's, that's again, being cautious for all the residents of Hattie. Certainly, I'd, I'd like to give the speech that I give. Zoning is that delicate balance. It's between the rights of the individual landowner and the rights of the citizens, neighborhood citizens. And that's what we have to contend with. And when you mention not my backyard, 
boy, that, that NIMBY is exactly what happened. Initially, the planning board was agreeing to two acres of growing uh, cannabis in an outdoor facility situation. And we were for the farmers. However, there was a preemptive strike. A farmer and some other outside people came and they addressed the uh, citizens of Shattuck Road and they claim, well, we don't want to grow it outside. We don't want the 100,000 square feet. We have to grow it inside the greenhouses. And that kind of got my attention too. And what they were initially, and these people that were proposing it, and the planning board was initially, was outside growing. So the whole situation changed when you came in with 100,000 square feet of greenhouses, with lighting, with potential smell, with an industrial look right next door. So we were not anti-farmer and, and because of this preemptive strike, it changed the attitude of all the neighbors and there's only about half of them that came to the other meeting. So kind of uh, the delicate balance that we're dealing with has to pass the muster of the Attorney General and certainly this is our job. Right, and I feel like um, a few hundred feet difference isn't isn't going to be prohibitive when there are large you know there are many potential parcels as as you were mentioning in in Hadley that aren't right in neighborhoods that that people do have some choices to where they can put things or grow facilities. Thank you. Can you make a quick comment about the property values? Um, I just happened to have experience in that area and, and have researched that, and I want to share some comments. Um, it's actually baseless, and when we have these conversations, I, I think it's really important to be respectful. Everybody has different hard health feelings, and so I mean that very respectfully. Um, but I think what's important to look at are the facts and to bring what's there. And a uh, fact is, since um, 2000, in 2018, after Colorado legalized recreational sales, there have been studies, I'd, I'd be more than happy to cite them for you, that um, there's a 6% increase in retail value. I know as a cannabis entrepreneur, when I got my properly zoned location in East Hampton, my rent was tripled over the previous tenant. And this is a common phenomenon across. You would see property values, both home values and commercial properties, rise very quickly because of the premium that these companies are willing to pay. So um, I, I do hear that a lot. There, are, there really aren't the facts to substantiate a decrease in popular um, in property values. Thank you. But does that apply to a residential neighborhood? Ma'am, ma'am, yeah, you weren't recognized. I'm sorry. That's okay. Mm -hmm. You may speak. But I don't see how that applies to a residential neighborhood. The neighborhood we're referring to is probably more residential than it is agriculture. The, and you could be referring to something as more of a commercial or industrial area. That I can see, but in a residential area, it's going to impact our home values. There's just no way around that. I don't see how that can be possible, but it isn't. Yes, ma'am, we're back. Yeah, I'm Kim Sherman. I live on Shadok as well. I appreciate, I mean, I love data and appreciate data, but it's also very recent data. So I would like to know what the trend is. It's a little hard to judge that the property values will stay up, particularly in areas where I think they first, they first became legal, there were lots of stories of people moving there because they wanted to access it for medical reasons and so on. So I would be more comfortable with that. Okay. The data is from 2010 to 2015, both before um, recreational marijuana came, and then the study was published in 2018, so they looked at uh, the three or four years and the after period. But um, the study to the point over there was particularly for home values and just the willingness that people pay, the demand skyrockets. Um, another article I, said, I saw as well suggested that um, the benefits, it's just an attractive factor. People actually do want to move towards uh, recreational retail marijuana zones. It, it outweighs the access to some of the electives. And um, this is just observational factual data. I'd be happy to share it with you if anyone wants to talk to me. I don't think anybody wants me to move to Pleasant Street, Ms. North Sampson. Yes, sir, in the back. Yeah, uh, I just would like to address a little the distances. If the zoning board wants to have, base it on the lighting and the odors, distance shouldn't be as big an issue. That you can use your power as a zoning board to grant special permits where it makes sense to grant the special permits. 
well, that should impact on communities and that it can control the odors, can control the odors. If it doesn't, then it should be a thousand feet back. Yeah. But it may be appropriate even at a hundred feet back, but 300 feet certainly. But the zoning board or the, uh, the planning board can regulate those sort of things. Yes, Lisa. Um, so I'd like to say, I mean, a lot of this is really about money. And it's about the residents who spend their hard money to pay their mortgages, to live in their house for 10 or 20 years. And the people who want to grow the marijuana who don't want to go to the industrial zone with their business and don't want to go to the business zone and they want to go where the price of the land is less expensive and they want to go on the ag res land and it's, it's really a money issue and I think it's unfair to the people who already invested in their houses, in their neighborhoods, in the sanctity of their homes to be put out by other people trying to pay less money to be on cheaper land, but they're not willing to just back up a little bit to not be close to our houses. And I think that this is not like growing squash or corn or tomatoes where you can go pick it. I have blackberries and raspberries at my house and the neighborhood kids run around my house and pick it and eat it. Kim can attest, her son's always over there. I can't grow pot plants, they can't come over and pick it. This is an illegal item, a drug, for kids under 21 years old. This is different, this is not growing a crop. And we need to treat it differently. Not everybody wants it near their houses. And I think that people who have already invested in this town, who already pay taxes, who have made their homes, should get at least as much respect as the people who want to bring businesses to the residential part of the Agra's neighborhoods. Yes, sir. Yeah, I think it's just worth noting. Um, I don't know how knowledgeable everyone is on cannabis, so it's probably just worth throwing it out there that um, when growing cannabis, the psychoactive compounds on the flower are only there for the last few weeks of the growing season, and this is an outdoor sun operation. Um, those flowers, upon ingestion, aren't active, don't induce any type of psychoactive effects. Um, in order to smoke those flowers, they must be dried. Um, that period must takes around a week to occur. Um, so any flower that would be interacted with by you know, a potential citizen, a, a child, um, it, would, it would produce more of an inconvenience on the grower than it would on the safety of any, any individual who decided they wanted to uh, take some of the, you know, the plants or ingest it for that matter. Um, I think it's just worth noting that the raw cannabis, cannabis in its raw form, is, is fairly benign and quite medicinal. Um, and as far as uh, Trying to trying to cultivate in the, the agricultural districts of the town, I, I think it would help to prevent a lot of the dividing of parcels that was mentioned today, the selling of farmland that you see and that took place in the 90s. It would it would bring value back to the farms. It would bring value back to farming. And I think it would revitalize a lot of this agricultural heritage that um, have been seeking to preserve. Hi, uh, sorry to chime in again, but uh, I really highly value your comments because it is about money, right? We have two residents right here trying to get into this game and the barrier entry is way off the charts. And so if you really restrict this, would you rather have a giant corporation owning 100,000 acres or a giant corporation owning 12 different little spots? You know, because either way, they're going to look at your bylaws and know how to do it. Whether it's hemp, THC, they're going to do it. And you can't prohibit hemp. And so all of the giant corporations, they'll come in, they'll buy out 13 of your parcel lands, all leased out on your farmers. Farmers won't get anything. And they'll get all the money from the hemp. And so really consider that. Anything else? I will update this bylaw with the comments we got talked about tonight. and get them out to you hopefully within a week or so. Our next planning board meeting that we'll talk about this will be on 1-15-19, which is the third Tuesday of January. The first Tuesday of January is New Year's Day, so obviously we're not gonna have a meeting then. 
and we have nothing really pressing to schedule an extra meeting for us, so we're going to be talking about this with one special permit on the 15th. Um, special permit is a home occupation that we talked about at 715, probably get to this at about 730 or so, so if you're here for 730, it'd be a safe time to get here, okay? If we talk about it much before that, it won't be much more than a few minutes into it. So. I, I also just want to add that we do have other things that we have to work on this year. And this will probably, I'm thinking that the 15th might be the last time we'll take a shot at this. I'm hoping that we'll be able to wrap this up on the 15th and get the bylaw. Um, get the last, I mean, sure, there may be a couple more comments that I might want to change, but for the most part, on the fifth, this rewrite should pretty much take care of everything we want to we're talking about. And hopefully, you know, the farmers aren't overly upset, the residents aren't overly upset. Like I said, one of the meetings, we can get 50% of each of you upset only at 50% in agreement, that's about the best we're going to do. We need two thirds to vote, get it passed, but hopefully with that, but at least you can, you know, we can live with this. Is the idea we're talking about is for the next, for the initial, we can live with this bylaw. We may not overly like it, but at least we can live with it for the time being with the idea that, you know, like I said before, come back in a year or so, we can amend it once we get some more information, better information. Yes, sir. One more quick, just to confirm, so when you're saying uh, that's a 5,000 square foot canopy space, not a building size, right? 5,000 square foot building. So the building, so I'm not sure if you're aware, but that would restrict the canopy space to about 2,000 square foot uh, because of the big, because of workspace area and, and spacing is internally in the building. And so from what I have understood about a canopy, about a building, that you can tier it and that a 5,000 square foot building could grow a lot more than 5,000 square foot of marijuana. No, no, that's not true because it's canopy. It's the tiers actually, can, the canopy area. So there's no stacking, there's no vertical growing. It's all the actual square footage that the canopy takes. So you need to walk between the plants and between the rows. And there has to be spaces on the outsides. Even on a, even on a uh, typical hothouse or a greenhouse, you need to have two feet off the side. I, I didn't so, say you're going to have to so you're you're losing space. complete perimeter. We, we were told you could tear it. Tier is not, not vertical growing. Tier means uh, you can divide, up, step up to different heights. Well, I'm, not talking no about you, I'm, I'm talking about you can layer it. Okay, so you that's can not allowed in Massachusetts law, no. Vertical growing is what it's called, that vertical stacking growing. So right. no, that's not, it's, it's, it, it clearly states in the uh, CCC's website, on the, um, they have a specific page that says um, <laughs> um, guidelines for, for communities and outreach for their bylaws. Okay. There's a whole section right well, on that. Well, let me ask you, which tier one is to go find out? Yeah, she, she actually took the liberty to print it out. Which tier one? 5,000 square feet of canopy or 5,000 square feet of building? 5,000 canopy. So the canopy space is is limited. Well, that's, that's what we're talking tier one. So that's okay. So tier one, that that's so that's a canopy size. So okay. I just want to make sure that you guys that the panel knew uh, that so you guys know the terminology between canopy space and actual building size. Okay. So how much? How much? But this is good information. I didn't know that we were under the impression you could you could layer it and yeah, in a in a, in a forty thousand square foot building, for example, you could go hundred thousand square feet. No, no, that's not that's not allowed. We were we were we were told that yeah, by somebody, somebody. That didn't, wasn't properly informed, perhaps. Okay. But this is that's actually clearly in the in the CCC bylaws. Okay. So it, it, how much can, how much room how much of a building do you need to grow five thousand square feet of canopy roughly? I mean that's that's also up to the individual. Um, I know with my particular layout, um, I'm doing living soil and raised beds. We're not doing hydroponic or anything like that at all. So um, we're, I'm I'm also using a hybrid style greenhouse, which gives me uh, a little bit more of a um, of a perimeter that, that I need because of the walls. So I'm only I'm only going to be able to a 5,000 square foot will only give me 3,000 square foot canopy space. Okay, so roughly. So ballpark, sixty thousand square foot building 60, would give you five thousand canopy, something like that. It's about sixty percent, sixty-five percent of the actual square foot. <laughs> but also, you got to keep in mind too that it's not all people are going to use that the same way. Some people want. I'm, I'm keeping. So how do we, how do we put something in the bylaw that we can measure? 
Um, well, you can restrict it to uh, the building size. Obviously, that's up that's to you. That's what we. That's but, exactly what we tried to do. But I wanted to make sure you understood that there was the, the building size did not necessarily reflect canopy space, and the canopy space was one dimensional, one one height only. So. Okay. We were under the impression you could tear it, and you could raise more than a five thousand square foot building could give you more than five thousand square feet. Yeah, they don't allow. They don't allow that, unfortunately. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that information. Thank you. Okay. So getting back to comment, this meeting will be continued. Well, not the meeting. We'll we'll talk about this bylaw again on the fifteenth of January. Okay. Thank you for coming. Have a good Christmas. Happy New Year. What else? I've got I have nothing else. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Meeting of history. Thank you, and thank you, John.